This episode is brought to you by Anaconda Notebooks. With nothing to install and nothing to configure, Anaconda Notebooks is a lightweight, ready to code, and fully loaded data science environment entirely in your browser. Spin up new projects with the click of a button with all the packages and files you need in one place. With fast and persistent cloud storage, no matter what, wherever you go, your code goes. And students, listen up. You also get on-demand access to Anaconda's data science experts. No matter your experience level, learn through hands-on experimentation, and you'll be predicting the future with machine learning models in no time. So what are you waiting for? Start coding with Anaconda entirely in the cloud on anaconda.cloud. Hi, and welcome. So I'm really excited today. We're going to be talking to Dr. Patrick Kavanaugh, who is an astrophysicist and a software developer at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And he works closely on the James Webb Telescope on one particular instrument, the mid-infrared instrument. And recently, he keynoted EuroPython and talked about Python and astronomy and some of the great findings and some of the exciting things that are happening with the James Webb Telescope. So today, we're going to talk about a number of different topics. Certainly, we're going to talk about astronomy and, and the Webb Telescope and, and the, the science that he is working on. But also, hopefully, we'll have a chance to talk about the intersection of open source software, how that's impacted science, and maybe some broader themes in that regard. So Patrick, welcome, and thank you so much for coming on to the Anaconda podcast. Thank you, Peter, and thanks for the invite. My pleasure. So I guess as a bit of context setting, let's get started by just telling the listeners, maybe who are, I mean, if there's anybody on the planet who's not familiar with the James Webb Space Telescope at this point, maybe you can give us a little context and share a little bit more about the telescope itself what it means a little bit for the astronomy community and for advancing humanity's understanding of the stars, and then also talk a bit about the instrument that you work on and some of the science that you're hoping to do with that. So the James Webb Space Telescope is an international collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. And it was a telescope, a next generation telescope that was designed to answer the biggest questions that humanity has about the universe. There were questions that couldn't be answered by the Hubble Space Telescope simply because Hubble couldn't observe the wavelength range in the electromagnetic spectrum to answer these questions. So the James Webb Space Telescope was conceived. It's a large infrared observatory. So most people will feel infrared as heat. You know, if you go outside into sunlight and you feel the heat from the sun, that's infrared rays coming from the sun and being felt by your body. The benefit of this is that it can see light that was emitted in the very, very early universe. And we're all familiar with the Hubble Deep Field, the Ultra Deep Field, which was looking back 13 billion years or more. But that was its absolute limit. Hubble simply can't see beyond that because the light that was emitted from the stars at that time in the universe loses energy as it travels across the expanding universe and gets what we call redshifted out of the optical range where Hubble is, is most sensitive. So it simply can't observe those stars. It can't observe the first light in the universe, the first starlight. And that's where the James Webb Space Telescope comes in. It was a six-meter mirror, so a big, big mirror that could collect light from very, very distant objects. It could see in the infrared, which is where the light from the first stars is now visible. Um, and it could also, that big mirror gives you very, very fine detail in the images. So you're actually able to pick out these first objects, these first galaxies in the universe from the background, okay, from what's around it. As well as that, I mean, the first starlight in the universe was one of the big science questions. The other three are the assembly of galaxies. So for example, we don't know how galaxies like the Milky Way form, when they formed, how they evolved into what they are now. Such grand design spirals like the Milky Way and Andromeda didn't exist in the early universe. So we can look uh, through cosmic history using James Webb to see how they came to be. The third is star formation and planet formation. So because James Webb is a, an infrared observatory, infrared radiation has the ability to move through the gas and dust that's around star forming regions and stars that are forming. So we can peer into the regions where stars and their protoplanetary systems, where solar systems such as our own evolved from, uh, we can actually look in at the very first stages of that with James Webb. Again, something Hubble simply couldn't do because that light was blocked by the material that was around the star forming area and, and star forming region. And the final one, which is always the most interesting for the public and so on, is to explore other worlds. So we know now that there's you know, thousands of, of planets around other stars. 
We know some of them candidates for arts or super arts and so on. And James Webb will be the first excellent chance of searching for things in their atmospheres, chemicals and molecules in their atmospheres that could indicate signs of life on other planets. So James Webb will take the best candidates, wait until they move across their stellar disk, their star's disk. We can tell how the light from the star changes as the planet moves across the front, what is in the atmosphere of the, of the planet. And that's just unbelievable to me that potentially this year or next year or the year after, you know, we could find something very, very, very interesting and exciting. Yeah, that's really interesting that all of these things you're describing are, of course, a big mirror. As an amateur astronomer, right, we talk about aperture fever. Any telescope that you have is always smaller than the ones that you want to have, right? So in the case, even professional astronomers, you know, if you can get a bigger, bigger mirror out there. You can see more. You can see with higher resolution. You can see further. But what's really interesting is that this instrument is purposely designed to look into a particular region of the electromagnetic spectrum. But with this one design feature, it achieves several different fundamentally, let's say, rather different science missions. Right, understanding early universe stuff is sort of Big Bang cosmology stuff. Understanding galaxy formation is a related but different, right? And then understanding star formation and the stellar evolution, that's a different thing. And then exoplanets is another thing. But all of these are unlocked by having this infrared capability. Is that an accurate assessment? Absolutely. And it goes even a step further than that. They're just the four big science themes of James Webb. It's a general purpose observatory, it can observe anything in the sky. And we've never had a six meter mirror in space before. And we've never had an observatory like this before. So it will absolutely revolutionize all areas of astronomy because whatever you look at, it's never been looked at like that before with such detail, with such resolution, with such a suite of unbelievable instruments that can really transform almost all areas of astrophysics and astronomy. You know, it really is something else. And the four big science teams, but for me, at least, that they're a, a look at, our, at humanity's history in the universe, because we're looking at how the very first galaxies and stars evolved, which led to us, okay? We're looking at how galaxies like the Milky Way evolved, which, of course, we evolved in. You know, it's our sun was formed and, and we evolved in the Milky Way. We're looking at young solar systems forming live, basically, right? The earliest stages. So that's part of our history as well in the universe. And then we're looking at other planets because we may be looking at what Earth was like millions of years ago or billions of years ago or billions of years into the future. You know, it's really um, those four science teams capture all of that history of us in the universe, but it can observe anything else and it will revolutionize everything, all areas of astronomy. I'm so excited about it. I mean, I was a child reading the magazines when Hubble launched, right? And then we had a string of robotic probes out to, you know, Galileo and, and others. Cassini, yeah, a bunch of these. But for me, kind of as you're describing this, I, I think one thing that the general public that's maybe is not into astronomy as someone like myself or, or you, one thing that the general public might fail to understand is that even though there's always a stream of astronomy headlines coming through the news, a lot of the things that we get are, you know, maybe theoretical advancements or some new interpretation of something or whatever. But something like the Webb telescope launching, it unlocks the opportunity just to observe. The big thing about it is looking at is the things we didn't expect to see, the things that we don't know we didn't know. And that aspect of discovery is so interesting and so exciting for me. I, I can hear the excitement in your voice as well, I think, for exactly the same reason. We don't even know what we don't know. When we start using, when we start looking at the spectra of planetary atmospheres as they transit remote stars, we might see completely different things. When we go and we look back in time and we look at early galaxy formation, the early populations, we might see some completely unexpected things. And this is really the heart of science. This is exploratory aspect and be able to collect all this data is truly one of the, it's just fantastic. When the web launched, it was like Christmas day or something like that, or it was like right around Christmas, right? I mean, our whole family, we were up watching the launch live on the big TV, right? It was just so exciting. So, you know, really just super jazzed about all that stuff. But let's talk about all that data that's coming down because all of it is data. And some of these things we're talking about, we can, again, have artist, you know, renditions that'll be in the, the stories and everything. And you see, a, you know, sunrise of a distant star over some like glowing orb of a dis distant planet. That's not what the pictures look like coming off the instruments, right? So tell us a bit about what is involved in going from, you got this big old instrument up there, 
what all comes down and how is it then disseminated out to the community to do the science? The first thing you have to realize, and no, no disrespect to any astronomer or astrophysicist who looks at images and does image analysis, but many people would argue that the real science or the real advancements are in the spectra, okay? That it's when you look at the spectra, that's when you really see the physics of what's happening. So Webb has a few different types of interest of instruments. Of course, it has the imagers, which produced those absolutely jaw-dropping images we saw. It has a suite of spectrographs or so spectrometers, so we can see deep into the physics of all these different objects. And it has things like coronographers, which, for example, will block out the host star in another solar system so we can see the planets. So it has that suite of instruments. And James Webb, on any given hour, let's say, is observing something with one of those instruments or one of those modes. That data gets sent back to Earth through the Deep Space Network. And of course, it's not as if you just go download and here's your pristine image, your beautiful tree color image that you can just send to the BBC or you know CNN or whichever news outlet. There is an awful lot that has to be done to that data before you get to that stage. So our data come down in, in, in a raw state, complete with lots of effects that are introduced by the telescope, by the detectors, all of this type of thing, which have to be cleaned and removed because we want to take out the effects of the telescope and leave only the kind of the signature of the light that came through the system, because that's where the science is. That's the light that was emitted from these objects, however many millions or billions of years ago. And that's where different instrument teams and the, you know, the calibrations come in. So all of that data goes through the James Webb Space Telescope Calibration Pipeline, which is a software package that was developed by the brilliant software development team at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. What that is, is basically a series of steps that those data are sent through that removes, you know, incrementally or however the pipelines are defined, removes those detector and telescopes effects where possible to leave the various science quality data products that are then sent to astronomers and astrophysicists around the world. And also teams, you know, of course, those astronomers and astrophysicists will say, hey, this is absolutely amazing. The general public will be interested in this so they can produce their beautiful tree color images or they can show the big water emission line or something from an exoplanet. They'll point to a peak, right? Yeah, yeah. That will grab world headlines. But between the telescope and the scientists is the calibration pipeline. And The calibration pipeline is sort of where the instrument teams come in, and I work on the mid-infrared instrument team, as you said. So we are the teams that best understand all of these effects that are introduced by the detectors, by our mid-infrared detectors. So we write software in Python to remove these effects from the raw data. So we apply our knowledge of the instrument to these corrections that are built into the James Webb Space Telescope calibration pipeline that is run automatically on all data that comes down from the telescope. So that's where our knowledge goes in to take that raw data and produce the science-ready products that are given to astronomers and astrophysicists. That's fantastic. I think for the general public listening, again, there's some of these things that may not be obvious to them, but you know, when we take a picture, even with your standard, let's say with your cell phone or with a digital camera you buy you know, from a store, you take a picture, the camera internally is doing a lot of processing to clean it up and give you this kind of cooked image. When it comes to when you're taking a picture with a multi-billion dollar space telescope, you also have to do that kind of processing, but then it's very, very explicit. And some of the things that people may not appreciate as someone who's attempted astrophotography in the past that I can appreciate is, for instance, with some instruments, they require, and it's quite, I think it was quite well publicized, the James Webb has that very distinctive design feature, those mylar sheets that protect it. And it took a month to cool the instruments down, I think, to their sort of a nominal operating temperature, right? And the reason you want them cool is because a lot of instruments, when to collect the data, you have to use electricity to power them. Obviously, they're image sensors, they need electricity, but that also warms them up. And so as you go through the period of an exposure, you may end up with the thing having more and more noise in it, right? Like if you take those two people who use digital cameras that are able to take pictures of high ISO, in a dark, let's say it's a dark candlelight thing and you can only expose for a 60th of a second, you'll end up with a very grainy image. And so when you're out in space, you're trying to take an image of something, you know, 10 billion light years away, it's even darker and grainier. And so a lot of data processing pipelines that Patrick is talking about in this case is about 
removing mm-hmm. that noise, but doing it in a way that's not optimizing for Instagram. It's optimizing for actual raw signal that we can get science out of, right? And so we have to be extremely honest. And I think someone posted on a group thing that I'm in for astrophotography, they were looking at what the James Webb was taking a picture of, and it was taking dark frames or something like this. And like, aha, even the Webb telescope has to take dark frames. So again, for the audience, what a dark frame is, it's where you take this giant multi-billion dollar space telescope with a six meter mirror, and you shut the lens cover, you know, you cover the front end of it, and you just take a picture of the back of the lens cover for a while. And the reason you do that is because then you can see the sensor itself. Are there hot pixels? Is there noise that heats up? You know, as it does a multi-minute long exposure, is there a gradient across it? All these things. And, you know, the ML listeners to our podcast, of course, they're familiar with the topics of bias in machine learning or bias in data science. Well, even when you build a big scientific instrument, there's bias in that sensor itself that you have to sort of do a lot, not sort of, you have to do a tremendous amount of work to remove the bias. In fact, there's, there's I mean, um, unbelievable amounts of work, right? That, that That's the software pipeline from SSI and then, or Space Telescope Science Institute, and then also folks like yourself who work on specific instruments even on that giant telescope. The work that goes into removing bias so that at the very end, we have a small precious signal but we have high confidence that signal means something. So I think that's something that may not be as understood because people might think, oh, they just took like my Canon camera, but made it a lot bigger and shot it up into space, parked it at L2, and now they get pretty pictures. And it's like so far removed from that process. And I wonder if there is a value to showing the general public what the raw frames look like and what it looks like as you process through each step of it. So there's an appreciation of how much let's say intellectual honesty has to go into getting the bit of signal at the end. Because I'm sure if we find evidence for, let's say organic compounds in the atmosphere somewhere else, it's gonna come under a lot of scrutiny because a lot of big claims are gonna get made about it, about extraterrestrial life. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you anticipate that happening? And what are your thoughts on how you know we can defend the rigor of science and of the software that's used to process this data if and when those controversies occur? You're absolutely right. Some discovery like that will be just scrutinized But you just have to trust in the work that we've done in understanding all of these different effects in understanding how to, you know, as you said, I mean, the dark is just one small part of it. We test it and we test it and we test it. And the understanding of all of the instrument teams, all of the telescope teams who are not stupid people, I might add, these are some of the most intelligent people in the world who've worked on these things for 10, 20 years and who are completely open about it. They're not trying to hide anything. There is a record of all of the tests we've done. All of the observations are, are out there or will be made public after proprietary periods and so on. All of our honesty is in that data and that final product and our understanding. So people may scrutinize it and say, well, is this real or is this detector? When the experts look at it and say, this is not a detector effect, I'm very naive, but I don't see how anyone <laughs> could not trust that. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about extraterrestrial life. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, how do you anticipate that happening? And what are your thoughts on how we can defend the rigor of science and and other software that's used to process all this data if and when those controversies occur? One of the things the telescope was designed to do was to measure exoplanet atmospheres, right? So in principle, if we get extremely lucky, it could detect some signature of life on another planet. That's something that will just reverberate around the world. We work so hard to, and it will be questioned, right? It's like everything. It's like any discovery like this. There's going to be people say, wow, we don't believe this. There's some issue here. There's this, that, or the other. It goes against our beliefs, whatever. I mean, there there would be enormous pushback to something like that. You just have to understand that the scientists who work on these things, we work so hard to understand our instrument, to understand the effects, to understand the telescope, to recover the pure science signal coming from these things. We make the data available. Eventually, it becomes public and all of our tools are public. So it's not as if we make a claim like this and say, well, here it is, believe it. We make the data available, the tools available, anybody who likes. Of course, you will need some background, you know, some expertise to be able to reproduce a result like this. But nevertheless, it could go to another group who could reproduce the result and say, yep, this is absolutely fair. So my thoughts on extraterrestrial life thing, if it happens, there will be enormous pushback. But we just have to say, look, this is us. This is what we've worked towards. 
This is everything we understand about our instrument, about the telescope. We're not trying to, you know, make this up in any way. This is what we believe is true. So the astronomy community has a little, shall we say, precedent in this matter, right? (laughs) Because if we go back, the big shifts throughout history, the big shifts in humanity's understanding of its place in the world has come from us looking up at the heavens. And it started with people just making notes about when things, where things were, when they showed up, when they moved, when they set every year, things like that. And, you know, the first astronomer to turn a telescope towards the sky has gotten a lot of hot water just for talking about what he saw, right? There's that famous painting of Galileo inviting the bishops or the cardinals to go and look for themselves to see the craters on the moon or to see the moons of Jupiter. All they had to do was go and look. You look at the end of the telescope to see there's nothing covering it. You look through the eyepiece, a spyglass that you can totally point to the horizon and see sailing ships. You point up towards the sky and you see the moon with all these craters that are pockmarked and it's not a perfect heavenly sphere, right? So they put Galileo in house arrest for that. Now, I'm not suggesting that you will get arrested, but like the other interesting thing is, and maybe some people don't know this, but he wasn't the first one to talk about heliocentrism, the idea that the sun is at the center of the universe and the earth orbits the sun. He was simply offering irrefutable proof of heliocentrism, or at least that there are imperfections in the cosmos. And this was a problem for the Catholic Church, right? And that was enough to get him house arrest. Now, he's been vindicated, I think, in the last 10 or 20 years. The Catholic Church has finally admitted they were wrong, but it wasn't that long ago. So I guess my thing here is, if we look at this, the whole point of this is like all these creation myths and everything else that all the, every religion has one, right? And I don't mean myths in a, in a pejorative sense, just like every major world religion has some story about how the world is created and why the world is created and why humans are special. So when you start showing people that there's, okay, pretty strong scientific evidence, it won't be a photograph of a purple alien somewhere, right? It's going to be a squiggly little line, probably a Matt Paul lib plot with a squiggly line, a peak somewhere overlaid on top of the peaks of earth. And you're like, oh, look right here. This is water. And here's some organic compound that could not have been created by any simple process, right? It has to be some basic biological process that created it. And this line plot is up against all the world religions. Exactly. That's a great description. Right. One little line chart. You know, the funny thing is, I mean, this type of analysis has already been done with Webb. And we had in the initial release and since there's been these transmission spectra of exoplanets where they're only now they're only showing water or carbon dioxide, which is still amazing. And there were great scientific discoveries in themselves, but everybody's perfectly happy to believe these. There's no question of these water or carbon dioxide features on some random planet where there couldn't possibly be life. As soon as you introduce that concept, that's when the questions will come. And suddenly all of the, oh, look at this amazing thing that JWST has done, all of that vanishes. And it's focused on this question. With the primitive Galilean telescope, there's not a lot to it, right? It's you cut it open at the end of the day, you just crack it open on your leg and like, oh yeah, there's a lens, there's a lens, piece of glass, I can see through it, put it back together. With the James Webb, you can't do that, right? There's a huge stacks of abstraction between the end user or the perceiver and the raw data. Absolutely. And I mean, this is where the questions will come, right? Because ultimately, now, I think it's very difficult for anyone in the public to truly imagine the telescope, right? Because first of all, the fraction of people out of the population who have actually seen the telescope is tiny, right? Who have seen it. Now, there have been scale models doing the rounds in the big cities. We even had the scale model here in Dublin about 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, we had in Austin as well. So you kind of get an appreciation. The general public don't have an understanding of the telescope, okay? It's just they see these pictures in the media and go, wow, this thing is, you know, sending back these awesome images or, or whatever. So the touchstone between them and the telescope is the scientists. That's what would be questioned, not the telescope. I think people understand that the technology is, there's nobody has designed some little piece of hardware that would introduce some random signal <laughs> into your spectrum, all right? So they'll trust the technology, I think. They think the moon landing was fake. I mean, why couldn't the CIA have in- injected a box in there to inject the complex biomolecule spectra at some point. They think the moon landing was fake, but they're not believing the people there. Do you know what I mean? There's a distrust of the people who are involved. I don't want to get into the moon landing conspiracy. I think ultimately it's a distrust of the of parts of the general public and the scientists. It's the old science versus religion or science versus whatever question. Well, it's a little bit of the institutions of science and what it means for civilization, right? It's now the ivory tower, 
if we call it that, again, it was sort of a pejorative tone to it. It's off in the clouds, and we can't really even see the priests going up in the highest levels in the clouds. They just come back down and tell us what they saw. They come down with a line with a squiggly chart. They come down with maybe they give us a television set with a cable running all the way up to the top of the tower saying, look, we're looking at these people landing on the moon. And you're like, I don't know. Maybe it was a soundstage, right? If you look at the, the climate change sort of debates that happen now as a matter of policy, they've actually shifted a bit. Because I remember when they started in 20 something years ago, not when they started, but when I was younger, the conversation was more about, is it even happening? Not, is it man-made? Then it became, okay, clearly weather is a bit out of whack and like, okay, but how much of it is man-made? And now it's shifted to, okay, maybe it's man-made, but maybe we can fix it. Maybe the projections are wrong. Like if people pay attention over the space of decades to how that narrative has shifted as acceptance comes in, there's always still wiggle room for it, right? And that's with something like climate change, where you can see everyone lives in their local climate. And if they've lived there any appreciable period of time, they can see like, oh, we used to get snow and now we don't anymore. Absolutely. But things like what Webb reveals to us, which some of the most significant questions that we could be asking about our place and the, and the universe and what's out there. And, and it lays a legacy for the questions our children and grandchildren will ask. This is some of the most I believe personally, astronomy is some of the most important work we could be doing as a species. And so with this cutting edge instrument, with the data coming from it, possibly having the potential to give us insights or clues that are literally would shatter the foundations, many of the religious structures, but just people's general sense of where they are in the world. I think there's something about something deep about how to break apart those clouds so that people feel like they have more transparency. They feel like they can go up the ivory tower themselves. And I think education of the public is something that is almost as important as building the next telescope. Absolutely. I mean, you really got it in one there. It's educating the public so they have some understanding of what, you know, of the scientific method, what's being done. I hear what you're saying about pulling back the clouds and everything, but there'll always be the section, the general public, who just won't believe it. Unfortunately, they're often the most vocal. And even with the climate change, you're saying that there's been a development over decades of, you know, from is it happening to the acceptance to what do we do next? I still hear on the radio that we'll get these people on to talk about, oh, this happens every thousand years in the Earth's climate pattern. This is nothing to do with, you know, human intervention in the climate. This is just what happens. I think there's no convincing some people. And climate change is one thing that you, you really can look out the window and see it, just like you said, you know, and I'm looking out my window here and it's kind of cold today, but we had temperatures of 15, I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, but 15, 16 degrees Celsius about a week ago or two weeks ago, right? It's probably about 80. That's pretty warm for December, isn't it, over there? For November. Over November, right, yeah. Absolutely, really, really warm. And flowers are still blossoming. There's still insects flying around, which would normally be long gone by, by this time of year. And this isn't unusual. It was kind of last year, it was warm until quite late as well. And I don't know how people can't believe it, but there's still this pushback and it's going to be exactly the same. Or, you know, if it happens. You know, it's going to happen for the people who don't believe maybe some of the exoplanet data and they have to wait for the UFOs to land and for the saucer land and for some creature to walk out of it and say, oh, there's aliens. You know what the very next thing they're going to say is that portion of the population? It was staged. No, no, not that it's staged. It's that they were here all along. Ah, uh, yeah, right. That it proves there were lizard people all along. This was not actually the first UFO to visit them. That's what they're going to say. Because Sir Francis Bacon, right, the great quote, that the root of all superstition, that the mind notices when something hits, but not when it misses. And so we can spin, we have mechanisms of the mind is a patterning engine. We want to find patterns and we want to convince ourselves that, it's, that our brains are good patterning engines. And we come up with a, a string of narratives. And whichever one of them connects, we go with that one, ignoring the other 50 that have failed us. But I suspect that will be what happens if actually a UFO comes and lands. It's just going to put even more energy behind the conspiracy theorists. The funny thing is, even if Webb detects something, day-to-day is not going to change. Okay, it's detected like, you know, possible biosignature on an exoplanet. That doesn't mean they're, they're going to come knocking the day after. Life will go on. Nothing will change at all other than we can say, well, we, we're kind of confident we've detected some signature on an exoplanet, which will be confirmed by the next generation of telescopes or the next or however it will develop. But it's like you're saying, it's just that shock to civilization. It's, it's just that 
people's idea of their position in life. <laughs> That's a fact. I'm going to have to come and visit you and we're going to grab a pint or 10 and we're going to play this out. If we find that bull, I'm interested in playing out the whole thing about what does it look like to get funding for the successor to web that's specifically designed? But I mean, it's already been done. Sure. I mean, my point is that because the question itself has implications for culture and politics, then the development of the scientific instrument to answer the question will intrinsically inherently therefore be politicized. And that's probably three pints in. And we'll go from there. <laughs> but let's switch gears a little bit, talk about the Python side of the world. Because uh, the reason I went down this little rabbit hole about the exoplanet stuff is because I think it is, to your point, it's so important for this scientific data that could have, well, I mean, outside of exoplanet and aliens and everything else, uh, or extraterrestrial life, there's a great deal of information and knowledge we can gain about star formation, galaxy formation, early universe kind of stuff. And it's important for all of that data to be processed with tools that facilitate reproducible science. So at least it's not one you know, big, big astronomy that controls all of the processing code and everything else, right? At least it's all open source. People can look at the code and see all this sort of thing. So what do you think about that? Tell me your perspectives there. You know, it's really amazing when you think about it. Like I know I keep thinking about how web has come to be and how the, the pipeline software and the analysis software has come to be. And I think back to when I started out. And before we got online, I was thinking, you know, on my CV, under software experience, there's a list of about 20 different types of languages, right? But there are all these obscure things like CL and TCL and the shell script and all of these other things. And what would a kind of a young scientist coming through now, what would that look like now? Because when I started 15 odd years ago, pipelines on the telescopes I worked on then were written in Fortran, but were controlled by shell scripts and like the IRAF, the great kind of grandfather. Well, I won't say grandfather, but you know, it's, it's been around for years and years of astronomical analysis is written in CL or, or, you know, some early scripted in CL. And you were just kind of bouncing from one language to another and not really getting a real look at the software that was actually doing the calibration, right? What you were learning was how you interacted with that software, how you would call a tool how you would do this, that, and the other. Whereas now we have, as you said, all of our tools are open source, right? They're all written in Python because of the open source nature of Python, because of its young scientists can come in and learn it quite quickly because it's designed to be like that, right? It's designed to be easy to pick up. And we see that our pipeline tool is out there now. Anyone can go and look it up, play around with it, see every line of code, all of the tests, all of the documentation, all of the examples, the same for the analysis tools, the same for our analysis tools that were developed during for commissioning to produce the calibration products. The calibration products are all public. The data, you know, there's proprietary periods on some for observers, but that will all become free eventually. Every single step of the process is completely open. When you talk about reproducibility of a result, there is nothing stopping one group from taking the data and the tools that were used to produce a result by another group and redoing it themselves. And even on top of that, again, I mean, this is all the stuff that was supposed to be public, but astronomy is a great field in lots and lots of ways. And one of them is that people are very open. People will develop tools and put those tools out there, even though they're not required to do so. But more and more, like, uh, you know, funding agencies and things are looking for stuff like this, where to say, well, if you're going to develop these tools, I mean, surely you know, you want to make these available. So first of all, for the reproducibility aspect, but also because if those tools are out there, then the community moves on. Because in a year or two's time, when somebody's looking to do the same thing, they don't have to spend months or years, in some cases, redeveloping some tool that already exists and is there to use. And because everybody has their Python experience, it's just a matter of, yep, yeah, I will take that, you know, uh, have my Anaconda distribution <laughs> install you know, the, the package into the Anaconda distribution and I'm away. And I like, uh, you know, I think we had said it before, before the technical put out, but the pipeline itself on the documentation, it requires an Anaconda distribution, right? You have to go get your Anaconda distribution, download and install the pipeline and install any tools you want on top of that. So it all sits in the Anaconda environment that you have everything you need. I mean, I, I can't imagine 10 or 15 years ago, 
that you could just have all of this at your fingertips without worrying about installation issues with compiling Fortran and C and C++ and this and to learn this script and language now and that script and language now. Everything right now is right at your fingertips. Yeah, it's something about, it rhymes a little bit with that earlier thing about the astronomy education of the public. It's software education for astronomers. Because if you think about it, if you just have to learn one language and maybe a couple of skills associated with that language to go and be able to do everything, Versus if you have to become a C expert and a Bash expert and a Fortran expert and a Python expert and a make file scripts expert and a Linux systems admin expert and all these things to be able to look at the sky. Oh, by the way, you have to learn, of course, the entirety of what it takes to get a PhD in astronomy or astrophysics as well. What it does is it creates this balkanization within a field that's itself already highly technical, highly specialized, somewhat underpopulated. There's not that many astronomers in the world given the magnitude of the research you're trying to do. And so I think that that's sometimes lost in this world of scientific computing in particular. It's kind of the redheaded stepchild. It doesn't make most of the science, hard science, cutting edge science, science, pure science does not make people a lot of money. So in industry, if you go into a CS program, you go to a top tier university and you get a computer science degree, you go and you get recruited by the big name trillion dollar tech companies to go or by you know, some big investment banks and you go work there, make lots of money. That's great. As a computer science major, I learned like compilers, I learned, you know, operating systems and network theory. I'm going and writing code and getting paid handsomely for it. And no one here cares anything about Fortran or about, you know, these astronomy things. And meanwhile, these scientists who go into these programs, they end up with these giant instruments, sometimes millions of dollars of microscopes or spectrometers, sometimes billion dollar space telescopes, whatever they are they end up with massively technical data processing problems that have a lot of computer science challenges to them and no computer science professional software engineers to help them do the work, right? The staff scientists also, there's a bit of the, a critique perhaps of the, the academy as a setup. A lot of staff programmers in these science groups don't get any love whatsoever. They sit there doing a lot of coding and they don't get any love. And I know for, at least in the, in the early 2000s, I had a lot of friends who are my vintage you know, I, I majored in physics. They went off to various places, but they would end up doing a lot of coding as grad students and basically be like a little like the code gopher in a hole. And that was like no way to get paper publishing credits or anything else, right? Authorship, nothing. And so you end up with scientific software being this abandoned the space. And, and so then it takes dedicated, I would say weirdos a little bit, like, you know, Fernando Perez, you know, making something like Python as an applied physicist or Travis Oliphant going and making SciPy and NumPy as a double E intellectual engineering professor. And so like this stuff emerged in the space, this internecine space between the disciplines. And yet it's become now so fundamental to how science gets done. And it's such an important leveling field. Well, I would say it reduces the friction of interaction between scientists and code and data. And it allows this compounding to occur that could not occur before. That to your point about the friction of using 10 different tools, which are different 10 set of tools than another research group, science can't get done that way. So that's really great to hear. And it's great, of course, great to hear that Anaconda is a foundational part of how you guys are doing all this stuff, which is really amazing. People talk about the JWST and how, you know, it's this collaboration between NASA, ESA and the Canadian Space Agency. And it seems like it's just this, uh, you know, very privileged group of people who get to work on it or get got to develop it or work on it at some stage in its development. but really in so many ways, kind of a, an achievement of, I don't want to sound very grandiose or anything, but an achievement of humanity, right? Because all of that development, all of that knowledge from the scientists, all of our work on the pipeline and understanding the instruments and stuff was built on things like using SciPy, NumPy, Anaconda, like the enormity of managing a project like that was built on the understanding of project management techniques and tools, you know, I mean, they're just two examples, but you know, all of that feeds together to give the whole project the roots it needs to go on to do, to to answer these questions, to potentially cause an earthquake in civilization. So it's not just that the privileged few who worked on the telescope are responsible for it. Well, and the CIA agents installing the special spectrometer. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope they don't flag this recording. That'd be great. That would get us so much more publicity. This is great. But, you know, it's all of that feeds in. So it's like we're standing on the shoulders of all this work has been done before to do these amazing things. And that's the reality of it. You know, that really is the reality. It is a civilizational project. That's really amazing. It's like we're playing the game of civilization, building a space telescope, parking a space telescope at a Lagrange point. 
as well as your achievements that you get as a civilization, achievement unlocked for humanity. But, you know, as you're talking about that, it makes me think of a very interesting thing, which is that a lot of the packages that are used by the scientific community, obviously the upstream code is written by tons and tons of different people doing their various aspects of research. And then the Conda package builds themselves. There's, of course, a lot of it being done at Anaconda, and there's a lot of it being done by the community in the Conda Forge project. And I think about the people I know through this community, which is only a tiny fraction that I know, right, of thousands of people in this larger kind of Conda community. But of those people, so many of them do come from the sciences. Of course, myself and my co-founder, Travis, both come from the sciences and engineering. And I think there's a set of shared values around why do we make the software? Like, why do we do this? Back in the World War II, there were some propaganda films we made in the United States. And it was like this black and white film. And it was why we fight. You know, it was like this like announcer. It was very grandiose language. We're fighting for freedom and all these things. And then I think we don't have a manifesto like that, of course, for the the Python scientific community. But I think there is an understated theme. If you go to the sci-fi conferences, there is a why we code. We're not coding to go and get million dollar salaries at Google and Facebook. Like we are coding and we've always coded because there is great value in this doing good things for pushing the envelope of human understanding. And it's not to go and raise a bunch of money from some Silicon Valley hedge, VC or whatever. We're writing this code because this is needed to do good science. And so at Anaconda, some of the, the open source projects that we've made, that we've incubated, they were created well before, I think, a large number of people understood why they were necessary. And then as they get adopted, whether it's large-scale data visualization through the browser, you know, to increase access, visualization of large data, then like things like our compiler project to improve performance, then things like there's some data access tools that we've written as part, initially started as part of the Dask effort, but they've taken on a life of their own. So projects like Intake and Kerchunk, these things allow for scientific data access in the cloud and in distributed environments. It tremendously facilitates scientific research on large data sets, right? So the Kerchunk and Intake projects are used by Pangeo, which is the Earth Observing Space Satellite Network, right, for NOAA and NASA to understand atmospheric and climate research. But then I think it will also probably come into play for a lot of you know, giving public access to the James Webb data because no one wants to download a few terabytes of data to start playing with. They want to write their expressions, have it move into, you know, be close to the compute. So all these projects we did, we do them not because we think we're going to raise a bunch of money or sell a bunch of it right now, right? It's because this is good for science. Now, it just so happens that the needs of industry line up with the needs of scientific computing. Once again, it's kind of come back to supercomputing at scale for AI, for large-scale machine learning on business data, things like that. But at the heart of it, the origin of all this, and I don't want this to ever get lost, the people who built it and start all this stuff, they did it from a set of shared values around pushing the boundaries of human scientific understanding. And that's just, it's so great to see that this is actually continuing to bear fruit and it's contributing to the civilizational project of, of the James Webb Telescope. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope the Python community realizes that the astronomical community, are like, you know, it's not as if we're not aware of this. We're very much aware of this, that this has made our lives so much easier, really so much easier. I don't mean to keep going back to when I was a PhD student or anything, but a sizable chunk of my PhD time was taken up just trying to figure out how to get something working, you know, how to get some package working, how to write a package, going into the numerical recipes book and typing out some function into the code to compile. And whereas now, if you want to do some operation on an array or some source detection, you just open your Anaconda environment import the AstroPy tools or full utils tools, import the matplotlib libraries. And there you go. There's all of everything you need with well-documented Jupyter notebooks in many cases that tell you how to do this. So what took me months and months to do can be done in about 20 minutes now. And just think of what I could have done in those six. Or that's, that's the sad part. That's the sad part on the flip side of the coin, right? I don't want to put a number on how many, much time, not wasted. Ultimately, it all worked out. But just the, the kind of gains in productivity in the astronomical community because of this work that was done by the Python community in the various packages and libraries. I mean, it cannot understate it. The astronomy community, and I'll tell this little origin story for those who don't know it, but the astronomy community was seminal, really, in creating the Python scientific ecosystem as well, in that, you know, some ancient history here, but the early, the first ray or matrix library for Python was numeric, which is quite popular. And when I started learning Python in 99, that numeric was the thing that was there. 
But then the Space Telescope Science Institute, which operates Webb and Hubble, you know, at the time, they produced, they had a different set of needs. So they produced a different library called NumArray. And NumArray was different than numeric. The API was different. Designs were different. And it had its own really useful set of capabilities. And so as I started jumping into the scientific Python community in the early to mid 2000s, the community was a bit split. There were two fundamental array libraries. And so people were writing adapters over them that would sort of import from one, convert to the other, and sort of like, it was an interesting time. But then Travis Oliphant, he was like, okay, wait, this is crazy. I wanted to build SciPy. I wanted to build this like Python toolbox and a replacement for MATLAB thing. And now, like everyone has gone off, you know, like making two different versions of everything. This cannot stand. So he went and kind of pulled himself up in his grad school apartment and built a synthesis of the two of them, drawing on designs from one, the API from the other, and made a thing called NumPy, which was released in 2006, I suppose. That then was the single unified Lego brick that everything else kind of built on top of. But a lot of the fundamental designs in NumPy itself was inspired by the designs that came from NumArray from the Space Telescope Science Institute folks. So this has all come full circle back to the you know, astronomy community, the general broader Python scientific community, and then the whole thing kind of building this really nice kind of thing. But I will say that to your point about how much time you did, how much of your time got sunk into trying to manage the software chain during your PhD, Travis did his work actually as a sort of a tragic tale he was an assistant professor. He was on tenure track and he failed to get tenure because he spent that year making this piece of software that which of course the entire world sits on now, but it wasn't publishable research, right? And so this kind of touches on a point I made earlier about how scientific software, how do we get that to be treated with a level of respect in the disciplines of science? It's great to hear, of course, NASA and others now are mandating, right? That the processing chains are open source and all these other kinds of things. That's all great but from an actual cultural discipline in the academy, right? How do we give proper recognition to people who work on the software part of making the science possible? Can someone get tenure by just writing a bunch of astronomy software? Absolutely unbelievable that somebody like Travis could invent NumPy or create NumPy and not get tenure. I mean, and I get perhaps, you know, I don't know when he applied for tenure or the, I don't know how to pray. Yeah, mid two mid aughts, so the two thousand five six time frame. Yeah, so NumPy was very young at the time, I guess. Oh yeah, it just came out. The only thing I could think of is maybe you know, the the impact of it hadn't been felt yet. Of course, right. I would have to believe that if he applied for tenure now, he would have no issues. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think he's, he's moved beyond that. He's out of academia. Now. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know. But let's say somebody did that. In my humble opinion, it's all about the impact that if you. It's true. I agree 100% that maybe 10, 15 years ago, if, if somebody had have just been, and I don't mean to say just as if, as if to diminish it in any way, but if somebody, somebody's entire career was developing and building and, and putting out and maintaining a, a software package, would be very unlikely over here, at least, that they would have got tenure. Now, I will say that if the impact of that is seen, so if it's out there for five or 10 years, and it is very clear that even though the developer may not have publications, there are a thousand publications that use the software. You have to imagine that that's enough. Well, but at that point, they've already moved on because they didn't get tenure and they can't do their third postdoc stint because they have you know, spouse, kids at home. They already went and took the $300,000, $400,000 a year job from Google, right? And now the entire field is impoverished. That's true. There are strides being taken to recognize that kind of contribution. I know Germany do now. Germany will recognize you know, the development of software tools for the community as good as publications. Okay, that's a good step. They're taking the first, like they seem to be taking, and usually in the EU, when Germany makes a move like this, everybody will sooner or later follow. It's a matter of time, I think, before it becomes somewhat on par with publications that you can, you know, develop your package, have it publicly available, have it well-documented, have it easily installable. Everybody can use it. And the kind of, the time invested in it and the potential impact is recognized by academia. So I have a bit of a, an oddball proposal, but I think that it is this question of, of recognition. And the issue is that the recognition of research scientists is around the science. And that's appropriate. That's totally, we're going to try to, I'm going to steer clear of all of the, there is a class of critiques of peer review as a process, right? And publish a parish as a, as a, a modality of how science is funded. I'm going to avoid all those critiques. Let's just say the Let's assume those are all fine, but even within that context, 
the way that scientific recognition is modeled right now, it, you know, looking at citations, things like that as a measurement of impact, I think that's, that's fine. The only tweak would be to maybe recognize that software projects themselves are better at identifying who within the, the code community has high impact. And so if what you did was simply take within any field, take the top 200, 500 papers for the year and go and poll all those authors, tell us the software you used. Or actually just point us to GitHub repos. Well, actually, you don't even need to do that. I mean, uh, the, the journals now require that you have small software acknowledgement at the end where you include the software packages you used. And, you know, some packages in astronomy do have publications. Others might be as an auto link. It's all documented now. Great. So it's documented. And then you can then just propagate and say, okay, look, here's the most popular projects. Here's the key thing. We will ask those projects, give us names of people that you want to give some of your karmic credits to. And those people will get credits as if they were cited directly in a paper, right? Basically, if you could do that bridge, the key thing here being delegate or novate or whatever the term is, that credit, that citation credit should go through to the projects and then let the projects adjudicate this. Because I know in the open source software world, there are people, unsung heroes, who sweep the floors, turn out the lights every night, they scrub the bug tracker, they maintain the test infrastructure, stuff that does not get it's zero love and zero respect from a research scientist, but which is absolutely foundationally critical to making sure the software keeps working, that it's correct, that tiny little precision errors are fixed, that people are watching it. So we just have to flow the incentives back that way. And you might find undergrads, humble undergrads in some unknown university in some corner of the world who just happen to be a linchpin person for some massively critical piece of like genomics research software, right? And there's story, I mean, the, the, I feel like my experience in, through this community is like, it's replete with these kinds of examples of unsung heroes out in the middle of nowhere who keep the lights on, on massively critical projects. They have to be able to get credit somehow. And I think that will create a virtuous cycle, even within, again, not performing peer review, not changing anything about publisher parish culture, just bolting on this additional little piece. I agree 100%. You know, in astronomy, it's often the case that there might be 20, 30, 40, in some cases, you know, hundreds of, of authors on a single publication. In my opinion, anybody who contributes anything to the publication needs to go on it. And not everybody would be of that opinion, that they would, you know, they would, they would apply some threshold somewhere. But even if it's, if you're working on some data that was taken on a ground observatory by a, a third year undergrad, I know the nearby university here brings their undergrads to an observatory in France. If one of those kids comes back with, with nice data that's then taken and used by one of the staff, one of the academic staff, and publishes a paper, that person has to get put on that publication because they're the ones that sat down, entered the observing program, you know, monitored and oversaw the observing program, wouldn't exist without them. The data set wouldn't exist without them. What, how can they not be a valid co-author on that publication? So it's the exact same principle. I, I mean, ultimately, it's going to be up to the software projects themselves to define that list of people. Maybe they need to have it on the repo. I don't know. Yeah, maybe that's a thing. It's like attributions, right? Dot MD or dot text or something. Right next to the requirements or something or the, or the readme that there's a list of the people who that they can just add and, you know, easily just add another name. And if anything comes from it. This is the list of people that get the credit, you know? Yeah, maybe it's like a BSD or MIT license plus EDU. Like if you just have this like plus EDU thing, which is no rights changed whatsoever. We have a request, however, in the license, which is that you look at our attributions.md file. And if you are using this for academic work, we would strongly suggest or, you know, whatever, ask, we would ask politely that you include this in there, something like that. I don't know. It just really gets me that continues 15 years later, this culture continues where, I mean, it's great to hear that Germany is making those changes and hopefully that will lead to a cascade of things, but it's still an uphill. Well, it's an uphill climb, I guess, because it is a zero sum game. If someone's getting credit and they can get tenure for writing software, someone else is not getting tenure for having published novel research, let's say, right? So there is a zero sum aspect to the competition, I suppose. I don't know how it works in the States, but I mean, is there a certain amount of tenure positions that go everywhere in the university? Or for example, is it the Department of Computer Science will get X number and the Department of Physics and Astronomy will get X number? 
you know, the, the, the people who are doing the pure research, they're not going to be applying for the same tenured positions as the software developers. But that's the thing. Being a scientific software developer is not the same as being a tenured position in the computer science department. There you're supposed to be doing CS research on like new variants of Haskell that are provably correct or something. Like, you know, there are things that are happening in the CS departments that don't have a lot of bearing in the near term for scientific research. Whereas every area of science and engineering sits on a foundation of scientific code that is still to this day neglected and underfunded. And of course, we try to do our part at Anaconda to fund open source stuff, to make tools available for free, provide the infrastructure for all the stuff. But we're a young startup, right? Like it's not the same as, as the, the universities with billions of dollars of funding. So, so yeah, anyway, that's just, I think that's a lot on that topic, but I'm quite passionate about it. Let's switch back to then the Python into astronomy in particular, which is, I think one of the, so tenure aside, what do we think about like the way that, so I have this quote that there's no such thing as data, there's just frozen models. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Like, how do you think about models? How do you think about data? How do you think about bias when it comes to astronomy and how you guys think about that, the processing pipeline and how to explicitly capture and track your assumptions along the way? This is leading up to the discussion of machine learning, right? And the use of AI machine learning and sort of like, you know, automated inference kinds of tools in the context of image processing, signal noise reduction, things like that. Well, the data are the data. They're unimpeachable to some degree. I guess you could think about them as a frozen model because this is our snapshot of our understanding. The, the raw data, at least, are unimpeachable. They come from the telescope and they get some minor, minor reprocessing and reformatting, but it's prior to the calibration pipeline. So it's prior to the assumptions, maybe that, you know, the assumptions and understanding, I don't want to say assumptions, but the understanding that we have been put into the data to create the final product, okay? So I guess that's what you mean by a frozen model. That is the the frozen model. There's a model for the the drift in temperature on the detector and all the things. Absolutely, right. So in terms of frozen model, the single reduction, so the the instant that or the the time it takes that raw data to get put through the pipeline, that is a a frozen model of our understanding of everything. It's a snapshot of it. That's not to say that that model won't change because our understanding of the telescope can develop. And, you know, and this is standard in astronomy that the calibration in soon after, we're only still only, it's hard to believe, but we're still only a few months since science operations started. So we're still very young. We're still in the very early stages of, the, of that kind of system and cycle of understanding the telescope because we've only been using it in orbit for when it's been in its orbit for, okay, I guess it, the first light was March, maybe. Only nine months. Still learning so much about it. A reprocessing of all data will improve the final products. And that's known. And that's why periodically the raw data in the archive will be reprocessed for everybody. You know, now, of course, you can grab the calibration pipeline and reprocess it yourself anytime you like, which again is an updated understanding, you know, the most cutting edge understanding we have of everything. So, in terms of the frozen model aspect, you say, I mean, It's not like that at all. It's not like we process it once and then that's it. That's the science product. I'm 100% sure that in five years time, when a much better understanding of the telescope and instruments will be available, that you can take the very first data set, reprocess it and learn something new. That's very standard in astronomy. My meaning in that statement is precisely actually what you're saying, which is that there's a tendency in the world to create a very binary way of looking at like, oh, well, this is data and this is what the data tells us, right? And my point of calling them frozen models is, What you call data is raw observation plus some model to denoise, process, make almost always a bias variance trade-off at every little observation point to produce a bit of slightly cooked data, slightly (laughs) cooked. But just that cooking process, there's a little bit of a model involved, which is a model of detector sensitivity, your model of the temperature gradient across the telescope because it was exposed to the sun at this angle while this was happening. Et cetera, et cetera, right? Maybe there was some terrible alignment of some deep space thing that was beaming something back to Earth and like zapped some, you know, detector. Anything could happen in this process. So there's always a little bit of a model that goes in. And as the world becomes more data driven, as more and more of our society is governed by machine learning and AI infused sort of policy and, and things like that, there is a tendency for people who are, again, below the clouds 
of the ivory tower of all the stuff. They just look up and say, well, this was a piece of data. So this is now sacrosanct and unquestionable. And because of this data, it, the data tells us this. I make that statement about frozen model to encourage people to realize, no, the data itself is a box that you can open up and look inside it. And there's always more data and more models. And it's sort of a bit of turtles all the way in, right, on that. But that's, again, why the education thing is so important to teach people how to approach. Like the fact the scientists are honest about this is great, and I would expect nothing less. But to encourage people in the world in general to not have almost a religion of data or treat it with a sort of a, a religious sort of like hallowedness. Oh, this is data. It's unquestionable. So that's where the education stuff comes in. That's actually where I think the open data aspect of James Webb is so critical, right? It's so great because now anyone can go out and play with the data and get access to it. They can experiment and look at how were these beautiful images made? What does this mean over here? What's this galaxy? I remember the, in the early data releases, even there are people just swarming over the stuff, right? And they're pulling, like, what are some of the things that you found very interesting about, like what maybe amateur citizen science picked out of that? Do you have any good examples? Well, I mean, there's the famous example. I think her name is Judy Schmidt, maybe. I, I hope I didn't get her name wrong. We'll figure it out and put it in the show notes. That's totally fine. We're doing this live. So she is a citizen scientist that used to take, I think she started off taking Hubble data and producing amazing images and did the same thing with, with the web data. And that famous image of Jupiter uh, with the moons oh. and everything, I think she had a big, like she had an enormous part to play in that, that she grabbed the publicly available data. Obviously, she had some expertise with professional grade, well, not professional grade, but you know, she had some experience with maybe the software tools that we would use compared to like photo, you know, obviously couldn't be Photoshop or something because there's too much going on that for Photoshop to deal with. It's SciPied. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or it's, I don't know. AstroPied. But that's, I mean, she's, and it wasn't just the Jupiter image. There was another one she worked on and I can't remember, but that like is unbelievable that, you know, just a member of the public could take the raw data and produce something that ended up in the NASA blog. Yeah, that's great. As a press release and all of this, you know, there's been other examples. I just can't think of them off the top of my head, but I can remember giving a talk a few months ago about other examples. I just can't remember. It was Judy Schmidt from, I guess, from Modesto, California. And she's um, just a hobbyist around this stuff. And no, that's right. I remember that picture. It's so beautiful and such great work. Oh, I was just going to say, when you're talking about openness and education and everything, I mean, one thing we've, I've managed to do since prior to our <laughs> technical errors uh, was that I, I've been working with people here at two institutes that are associated with the Department of Education in Ireland. And now we have a project, project work for 12 to 15 year olds that would go out to all of the schools in Ireland. You know, it's available for all of the schools in Ireland working on the first field, the first deep field image. So hopefully things going well over the next year or so, every kid in Ireland will get a chance to play with and understand that data just by looking at the image and like using the shapes and colors of the galaxies to infer something about the universe. And I know there's stuff like that going on all over the world. I think that's the, you know, kind, of, kind of circling all the way back to our very first topic around getting the population, getting kids, students, right, from the very beginning of their educational journey, getting them to understand that this is all out there. You can play with it. It's not just someone coming down on, from on high in some ivory tower in the clouds, giving you some pre-digested thing. You can go and play with it. You can look at it. And it's really great to hear about how fundamental the role Python has had in this and that, that it's uh, helping to accelerate the pace of, of science and scientific discovery. And I'm looking forward to even more astounding and amazing images and results and possibly some groundbreaking little squiggly lines coming from, <laughs> from all of you great folks at the Webb Telescope uh, Research Initiative. So thank you, Patrick, so much for joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with us. And thanks for all the great work and the great science. No problem. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much. Absolutely. My pleasure. And for all of our listeners, thank you so much for listening. Hope that you found this episode interesting and engaging. All my CIA friends who might take umbrage at my allegations of them installing rogue spectrometers on the telescope, I was just kidding. It was just a joke. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And we hope you found this episode valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star review. You can find more information and resources at anaconda.com. This episode is brought to you by Anaconda, the world's most popular data science platform. 
We are committed to increasing data literacy and to providing data science technology for a better world. Anaconda is the best way to get started with, deploy, and secure Python and data science software on-prem or in the cloud. Visit anaconda.com for more information.